you know, religious belief and why it's bad. But I haven't heard a lot of people talk about the strategy to confront it. You just touched on it a little, and it's the fight. Um, I, I've heard you speak kind of against religion a number of times, heard you in D.C. Uh, years ago give a keynote, no exaggeration, still the best talk, the most inspiring thing I've ever heard anyone give publicly like that, and saying so makes me sound really unbiased in this interview. But Well, very kind of you anyway. But during this talk, you referred to secular humanists, skeptics of religion, people who believe that what religious believers believe is nonsense and destructive, well, that those of us who believe that um, are a cognitive elite. You said of secular humanists something like that they're the last best hope for humankind. So speaking about strategy, do you think that sales pitch is going to work? Let me just draw an analogy to put a finer point on the question. The gay and lesbian movement, they're, they're trying to change everyone's minds about it being all right to be gay, but they're not also making the argument that being gay is better than being straight. But Dawkins and you and Sam Harris and others do actually say being an atheist is better than being religious. Even if I agree, here's the question. If we atheists and secular humanists are a cognitive elite, does it help us to rub everybody's nose in it? Well, I say in my book that I have a big disagreement with great respect with um, Professors Dawkins and Dennett for their nomination of the word bright as the slang word for, for an atheist. I think that that does run the risk of making people feel that we're talking down to them, that you have to be smart to be an unbeliever, that only stupid people could possibly believe any of this. Um, and I... It, it, my objection to that is not just tactical. It's, it's my absolute conviction that a person of absolutely average intelligence and education is capable of seeing through the claims made by priests and rabbis and mullahs, and always has been. And in one of my closing chapters, I, I give a, a history of the unsung heroes of our movement, the people who never were able to believe the nonsense that they were inculcated with. That said... I, I will say it doesn't necessarily apply to the individuals concerned, because after all, Alfred Russell Wallace, who did a great deal of Darwin's work for him, indeed is thought by many people to have done more work than Darwin did on the origin of species, was a spiritualist. Yeah, he believed in the paranormal and spent a great part of his career studying the paranormal. Joseph Priestley, a Unitarian secularist who discovered oxygen and was a great defender of the American Revolution and who's laboratory was smashed by a reactionary Christian mob in Britain at the end of the 18th century, believed in the phlogiston theory. Um, Isaac Newton seems to have had some uh, appalled interest in, but appalling too, interest in alchemy or some such nonsense. It's, it's, um, there's, there's no protection offered by a high IQ or a high level of culture and education against stupidity and illusions, whereas what the religious rather condescendingly called the simple folk, uh, are perfectly capable of seeing when they're being lied to. To backtrack a little, you're one of the most outspoken secularists, and you're also one of the most outspoken advocates against Islam out there. Uh, you're advocating a war of ideas, maybe even an actual war on Islamism. How do you explain the fact that more secularists haven't joined up with you, that more secularists don't agree with you? I guess I'm asking you to comment on the seeming lack of courage among the secular left. Well, there are two forms in which that takes, and I don't accuse my opponents of lack of courage, I'm, I ought to say. Um, the first is that many of those who, who would not disagree with me when I say, not that there should be a war with Islam, but that there is a war with Islamism, whether we want it or not, it's been declared on us and we must win it, um, would go on to say, well, that's all very well, but I don't want it putting me in the same camp as George Bush, who's a half-baked Christian fundamentalist in his own right. You see, I, I think that that's just confusing apples with oranges. It doesn't really matter whether the President of the United States is or is not a Methodist or, or a believer in God. That our society would still be under the same level of attack by jihadism. But I do understand that some people are very, very dubious about any war with which this president or his party are involved. Further to the fringe, there are people, unfortunately, some of whom would have called themselves leftists until recently or are thought of by others as being left-wing, 
who have run away with the stupid idea that because Islam is a third world religion in some ways, it claims to be universal, of course, but is in practice a, a religion of the third world and of the brown skin, it must have something in common with some sort of liberation theology. It, it, it must be to do with protests and grievances by the poor in, let's say, Gaza or Kashmir. All these people need to do is uh, look at how al-Qaeda's first attack was not on the United States or even England, but on um, India, uh, another great multicultural, secular democracy where the majority viewpoint is still Hindu. And that's considered to be the most odious possible heresy by Islamic extremists, and they've been making war on India for longer than they've been making war on us. People should get over this idea that Islamism is in any sense a protest against real conditions of injustice. It isn't the answer to the problems of poverty and unemployment. It is, it is what produces poverty and ignorance and unemployment. Switching gears, Christopher, uh, I, I kind of see you as different than Dawkins and Harris and, and Dennett uh, in, in the following way, and I want to ask you a question about it. Most of the people who listen to Point of Inquiry and who love the four of you, the four horsemen of the counter-apocalypse, they read science texts, journals, magazine articles, uh, but I'm talking about the great literature, the Western canon. As I mentioned uh, really quickly at the beginning of our conversation, when I first heard you, you were talking and debating about Homer. So it's kind of like you're an interloper here among the died in the wool secularists who themselves tend to be science fans, maybe at the exclusion of literature, maybe scientific rather than literary. So though you don't talk about it in your book, I think you have opinions about it. What are they missing, those science secular types that aren't coming at religion from your perspective? Well, there is an argument made by, not just by believers, but by people who are sympathetic to believers without being believers themselves, that says the following. Uh, atheism may well be logically and rationally defensible, even true, if the word true could be used. But it's a bit arid. It's a bit dry. It's a bit soulless, if you like. What about the transcendent? What about the human need for something a bit beyond the material world? You see, what I want to argue at this point is that we have, thanks partly to science, I would add, a perfectly good reply to that. If you want to look at something that's marvelous and awe-inspiring, uh, you take a look through the Hubble telescope and see the incredible majesty and mystery that's being revealed that way. You can't do that and then be impressed by the burning bush. Um, we do have a need for the transcendent, but we, it doesn't mean at all we have a need for the supernatural. If, if you want to listen to a, a symphony uh, at sunset and look out at the beauties of nature from a mountaintop, then you should, and you should read the poets and essayists um, and lovers of nature and of the natural order who make that possible and enjoyable for you. We want all this to be a part of our critique. If you want to consider you know, the important moral questions and dilemmas that can never really be quite solved, then why not try uh, some of the plays of Sophocles or the work of George Eliot is one of my strong nominees, or Dostoevsky or even Kafka, Shakespeare. There's much more uh, tension and drama and uh, ethnic and, and moral discussion to be had from these than from any of these uh, Bronze Age hateful texts. Do you think taking that approach puts more meat on the bones of atheism, that it's not just science decrying nonsense belief, but, in other words, can the humanities uh, flesh atheism out? I mean, atheism is, by definition, something that you don't believe. It's, it's based on a negation. It's a necessary negation, but not a sufficient one. You simply say people won't start to grow up or develop until they can get rid of this belief that comes from the childhood of our species. But that's only, as I say, a necessary, not, it's not at all a sufficient condition. It doesn't tell you anything else about what an atheist might be like. Indeed, an atheist could be a, ni 